And in our study of Genesis, one of the things that we have done is that we have been dealing with the, uh, right now, we're in the section of the, uh, of the patriarchs. And we've learned a lot about some of the patriarchs that are part of our lineage as Christians. For the same faith that the patriarchs have, so do we. They look forward to the Messiah coming. We look back to the Messiah, namely Jesus Christ, who has come and has died for sinners like us. As we go, if you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 28, we're going to look at a passage, famous passage about Jacob's ladder. You've heard of Jacob's ladder. I remember in high school or, or junior high, there, when you did these um, uh, little things with string, you could make a string uh, in several different type of, uh, I would guess, if, if, I, if I put a word to it, it'd be like models. You'd make a model out of a string, and one of them would be Jacob's ladder. And as we look at Jacob's ladder today, we see chapter 28 of Genesis being about one thing, about how God is shaping all of our lives so that not only that we would be like him, that we would, be, we would know God, but we would know God in a fellowship sort of way. God is working in our lives. And so even before we come to Christ, God is working. If we are seeing God work in our life, we know that everything even in our, uh, uh, our, our, our time before we knew God was part of God's plan for our life. God is never late. I might have a story of Pistol Pete Maravich. Pistol Pete was a guard, famous guard for the uh, New Orleans Jazz. The team now has moved to Salt Lake City and is now the Utah Jazz. That's right. But in the Utah Jazz, one of the things that, that they did was, one of the, one of the issues was uh, in the New Orleans was that he, he was basically an agnostic. He refused to go to church. He was not interested in religion at all. But someone one time gave him a, a track that he kept in the bottom of, uh, I guess, a box in his home. And it was during a time when he was moving uh, from one place to another in his life, he found this little gospel tract. It had been given to him probably 20 years earlier in his life and made move after move after move after move. And one of the things that he did was he found out and he read this gospel tract that during one of his moves and all of a sudden the gospel became real to him and he repented of his sins and as far as I know, Pistol Pete Maravich is a believer in heaven today, rejoicing with God. Because God was working even before he came to Christ. It's the same thing with each of us. We can, we can recall times when God was moving in our life and he was working in our life to bring us to Christ. In fact, in Genesis 27, he, he says kind of the idea that Jacob's not quite there yet. Jacob has this lineage of godly, uh, the, the chosen lineage, but he doesn't have this relationship with God yet. Because he talks in Genesis chapter 27 about your God, Isaac, your God, not my God. But in chapter 28, verse 21, he, he calls God my God. And so I see that chapter 28 is a pivotal chapter for Jacob because Jacob, I believe, in this chapter professes faith in Jesus Christ as his Lord, the Messiah as his Lord. You see, there's a difference today between knowing about God, which a lot of people do, between knowing God, which some people do, and fellowshipping with God, which very few people really do. You see, all events in our lives are caused so that we would fellowship with God in an intimate and a loving way. God is working to strengthen our lives. He's working that our lives would be a point of spreading the gospel to many people in this area. And so as we look at chapter 28, we're going to look at this in two, three sections. But I want us to understand that this is all about God working in our lives. He's at work. He's at work at spreading the gospel throughout this world. He's work at establishing our fellowship, and he's working at strengthening our lives. So this morning, or this evening, excuse me, every single event in our life is part of God's good and sovereign plan for us. 
Look with me at chapter 28, verse 1. And I want to read the first nine verses first because we see this in several ways. It says, the Bible says, Then Isaac called Jacob, blessed him, and directed him, You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise, go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you that you may take possession of the land of your sojourning that God gave to Abraham. Thus Isaac sent, to J sent, thus Isaac sent Jacob away. And he went to Paddan Aram to Laban to the son of Bethuel the Armenian the Ar Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau's mother. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take a wife from there, and that he blessed him and directed him. You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. And Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and gone to Paddan Aram. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac, his father... Esau went to Ishmael and took, a, took his wife besides the, wife he's, the wives he had, uh, Mahalatha, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaotha. And so you have here, first of all, a journey. In God working, remember, God is working in all the things of our lives. And he's working in the life of Jacob. And here we see Jacob's venture for a wife. You see, Jacob is realizing that it is costly to become a deceptive person. See, Rebecca, in, the, in our last chapter, in verse 27, which we talked about last week, devised a scheme to keep the blessing and have the verbal blessing of Isaac upon Jacob. And she did so by deceiving her husband so that her husband would put his hand and bless Jacob. But at what cost? In chapter 28 of Genesis, we find that her plan meant for, for Jacob to go away, ideally for just a couple days. But we're going to find that Jacob actually goes away for 20 years, and when he comes back to the land, Rebekah is presumably dead. She never sees her sons again, and the cost of deceptiveness is very real in the lives. And God is working on Jacob to purge that deceptive uh, characteristics from him, though he had it in his heart. You'll notice also in his venture that his father gives, gives him instructions. He gives him instructions to go and marry a woman from their family, not a Canaanite woman. This is very important because the lineage of the Messiah would have been broken if, if Jacob had married a Canaanite woman. Well, the unusual thing about this is that, yeah, you know, Jacob's old. He's about 77 years old. It's kind of old to be thinking about getting married, isn't it? Wouldn't you say? Yeah. Now, we know that he didn't get married until seven years after that, 84 years old. So the wedding ceremony was a lot of people that were older in years. 